Hello, MozCon. Hey, Marshall. How are you? As Cyrus said, uh, my name is Marshall Simmons. Uh, I work and am the founder of Define Media Group. We focus on audience development, enterprise, search engine optimization, and business management. A lot of our focus is primarily in the publishing industry, but we play with e-commerce and in the investment community as well. But I think it, it's important to set a little context for this, for the presentation here. I think it's important to give you guys a little bit of idea because I come from Boise, Idaho, which for those of you who don't know is just right next door. I grew up in Boise, Idaho, moved to Oregon for another 18 years, and now I'm back in Idaho. So when you live in those places, you have a tendency to go outside a lot. And so as a result, I, I've been known to climb things. And not always enjoyably climb, climbing these things, but climbing them nonetheless. Because what I've found is that when I'm outside, I find things that, that nurture my soul. I'm able to see things and experience things that I've never seen before, kind of like this. And when you're out there, it's a tremendous experience because you can all of a sudden come upon this huge meadow of the flower that you named your daughter after. That's powerful. Not only that, but you can surprise Mother Nature. I don't advise it, but you can. And sometimes it's dangerous, but it's nice to see. So when you're trudging up a mountain and you're hungry and you're hot, you ha and you don't have anything but your own thoughts, some things pop into your head. And usually it's the song that you like, but quite often it's the song that you don't like. And that can be terrorizing. Does anybody know who this is other than Matthew Brown? Yes, that's right, it is Striper. I don't know any song from the band Striper, but a song from Striper popped into my head on the last hike that I was on and I don't know why. So of these things that continue to come into your head and pop into your brain, you lose focus. And so you have to have those songs that you sing or those things that you think about. And when you're hungry, I think about food. And I think about good food and I think about donuts. That's the focus and that's the discipline that when you're on 30 miles and you're out there and you're pushing up this hill, you think about food. Now when I started doing all this, I did it wrong. That's my pack on the left. And we are on a three day, 50 mile hike and I took 60, or excuse me, 62 pounds on my back because it was the Boy Scout experience. I wanted to be prepared for everything. I took every tool and these other guys just laughed at me. And that's dangerous to do and I don't advise it. And what I learned over this period of time is now I've reduced my pack to the one on the right, which is now 10 pounds of base weight, which is a heck of a lot easier. And I, have, I brought the tools that I need, not the ones that I wanted. And the third thing that I do when I'm out there is I count my steps because it gives you something to do. And we have a lot of data available to us. And if, if it's the Fitbit or if it's the Nike Fuel Band or the Garmin, you can see, and you become a more efficient hiker because I can see what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, where I'm doing it, and what I need to be doing. And all this data is available to me. And it's extremely powerful because now we can turn this into this sexy data. Right? And we're inundated with sexy data. It's everywhere. Publishers are embracing this data. And it's becoming extremely useful. It's useful in ways that we haven't even seen before, but we start to see publishers starting to utilize this data in a way that tells stories. And these stories become powerful because it connects us. So for example, this is an incredible visualization of a company, and you can find this at IP Viking, that's tracking in real time every cyber attack that's happening around the world. It's the only time I'll say cyber, by the way, but cyber attacks that are happening. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful, it's not actionable, but it's a great promotional tool. We also have access to every one of the weather satellites that NOAA makes available to us. So we can track what's going on with air currents, temperature, specifically wind, if you're a pilot, you can zero down to the airfield to see wind velocity. Very actionable, very cool data, and beautiful. The New York Times has embraced this big data journalism and used it in a number of different ways, whether it's talking about an avalanche, whether it's a dialect quiz that you may have taken, 
or it's this, where they actually just took Google Map data that everybody has access to, took Google Map data, and located a specific neighborhood in Detroit. 43,000 properties that are on the brink of foreclosure. And they took a statistic, a number, 43,000 or 10% that you hear on the radio that goes in and out, and they made a story out of it. And they connect you to it. Because you look at these people's homes and you see this is a visceral experience. This is not just journalism. This is an experience that you can only have if you're utilizing this data and collecting in a way to make the story possible to make and really connect with users. That's powerful data. 538 that everybody has been talking about, Rand talked about it yesterday. They did some incredible coverage that made big data cool around the World Cup. If you haven't checked out, they, they have a bracket for America's best burrito. Highly actionable. There's open source crowdsourcing abilities with Target Map where you can actually, if you're monitoring this, you can make a map that shows where radiation is at its worst in Japan, and that's important, actionable data. But by far the best, in my opinion, is this guy that collects every set list the band Fish has ever played since 1983. And he makes it available. And with just a little bit of massage, you can show that, I mean, who knew? You and Joy and myself have been played hundreds of times more than ACD bag. That's actionable. That's important data. Now, throughout all this, we've seen all this beautiful, big, sexy data. And it is. And it's actionable. But there's some bad news. The bad news is SEO is not sexy. It's not sexy at all. Why is that? It's because social's grabbed all that light, right? They, they've got tools like BuzzSumo, and they've got you know, the topsies of the world that take real-time analysis, sentiment analysis from across every different medium, and they compile it so you can see it in real time and act on it. That is sexy. That's the shiny object that continues to pull from our budgets as an SEO. Right? And we're constantly fending off these attacks, too, because you get this irresponsible journalism that's doing just clickbait, like, Buzz, like, well, like BuzzFeed's doing, saying that this year, Facebook far surpassed in their network, which we have access to, they have this data that, that Facebook has far surpassed what Google is doing, which is totally wrong. And then you get this irresponsible journalism kind of compel or, or compounding on itself where the Atlantic picks it up, Recode picks it up, and regurgitates this, this message that your managers are hearing and they're reading. And then Comscore comes out and says 67% of the market share is Google's. We won't tell you how, we won't tell you why, but it is. Your managers are reading this. And if they're looking at their budget and they're trying to see, OK, where do we allocate budget for 2014 and 15? We've got social on this side and SEO on this side. Social's being louder. And so our budgets are being taken because of this misinformation. And so our job as SEOs, we're constantly combating this misinformation, whether it's at the company level or if it's at the corporate level like this. So SEO isn't sexy. But we have big data. We have big data, but we have to make it useful. We have all this data. Everybody in this room has access to this data but we have to make it useful and we have to make it actionable. And you have to go to school. That's unfortunate, but it, you have to go to school. And the school is the school of Annie Cushing. She's making SEO data sexy. So go do your time and learn. And if you don't do your time, have somebody on your team go do the time to learn about how to mark this up and make the, this data sexy, because it will help. Because if you treat SEO just as a project, it will fail. The day your manager or your boss thinks your SEO, the SEO on the site is done is the day you start your path to failure. Because SEO can never be done. There can never be a start, middle, and end point. It's a constant evolving process, right? Google is constantly moving. Because you can't half-ass this. If you go in and just kind of do SEO, it's going to fail. You have to be all in or out. If you're not using all the data that you have available to you from your client list, or from your company, you're missing an opportunity. 
So part of what we do when we work in the enterprise level is we validate. We work with SEO teams all the time, and our job is to point to them and say, yes, what they're saying, for whatever reason they've been marginalized, what they're saying is true. We have to prioritize that appropriately. And so that's what I want to do. I want to give you some validation about the data that we're seeing. Because there's so much misinformation, we need to set that record straight. So the methodology we use is across our network. We have access to about 250 sites. For this, we took 127 across 59 brands, or excuse me, 59 categories, 119 billion total page views, 28, vis 28 billion visits, and 15 billion total search visits. That's the data that we're going to operate, and we're going to slice and dice throughout the rest of these slides. So you're able to draw conclusions on this billions and billions of data points. And that's important because, again, we have social that is taking our budget and taking the attention away from the focus at where it should be. Because Comscore is wrong. They said 67% of that market share is Google's. That's not true. It's just not true. It's about 86%. Unfortunately, Comscore won't tell us whether and give us any transparency as to how they're pulling in that data. Well, we're looking at 1.3 billion search referrals, and 86% of that is going to Google. Now, if your marketing manager was to look at this and to look at Comscore's number, any person worth their weight in salt is going to look at that and say, we need our piece of that pie. 86% of traffic is coming from Google? You bet. And that's exactly why Google's not correcting Comscore's number. They don't want that number to be out. That's a huge number. That invokes all kinds of attention they don't want. Comscore sets the ad rates. Do you want your boss thinking that Comscore is correct in that sense? No. And if you drill down a little bit further on that data, it breaks out where we got 39% coming from direct, 39% search, and 22% social across 4.4 billion search referrals. Search has never been stronger as well. We're seeing, on average, about a 42% year-over-year growth. That's strong. And it hasn't seemed to, to, to change. We see, that, we see those, these numbers continue to increase. It doesn't mean social's not changing, though. And it doesn't mean that social's not growing. Social is very important. And any part of a good so SEO strategy should be walking hand in hand with social. You should be working with those teams to ensure that there is, a, there is a compromise and at least there's a combination of strategies there. So we take all this data and we use it so we can get some shit done. So that's the validation piece. So when you're going into this, we need to change some ways of thinking. And we need to think about this in a different way. And that's Panda is your greatest ally. If you're scared about getting hit by Panda, if you're concerned, you probably deserve it. This is the best way to get the attention that you need, to further your agenda, to further your SEO agenda. You want to, you want to future-proof yourself? That's the smartest thing that you could possibly do for your site, is to prepare yourself against all these, these changes that Google's making. Google is constantly moving the goalposts. That's job security. That's why SEO is going nowhere. That's why SEO will never die, because Google keeps changing what's happening, and they need somebody to interpret it. So we are the interpreters. There's no smarter move than to future-proof yourself so when your boss comes to you and says, what are we doing about Panda, you've got an idea. Or what can we do to prepare, we've got an idea behind that. We've got an agenda that we want to push. That's the best thing that could have happened to us. You want to see these? Google's been making these kind of changes for years. Go back and look at the Florida update. These changes happen all the time. This isn't new. Panda isn't new for, all of us, for a lot of us in this room. We've seen this. We just don't care about it. It just gets the noise out of the way so we can get that traffic. So far as the strategy is concerned and the tactics are concerned, as we pointed out, there's so much misinformation that the first thing that we have to be doing is training, reinforcing a message. Because as organizations grow, as there's turnover, we have to continue to reinforce this message. And we should be training at every level. The editorial teams, product teams, tech teams. Why wouldn't you be talking to the biz dev teams or legal to make sure that any contract that goes out the door for syndication is future-proofed? Or at least you're preserving the link equity or the domain authority of the site. 
You should be training everybody in the company, upper management, as much as possible. There's so many things to talk about. You can talk about keyword research, video, images, how to write title tags, how to write headlines, and you should on a monthly basis because people get caught up in their deadlines and they forget about SEO. Editorial teams love to forget about SEO and they have to go back and retrofit and it's too late. If you're dealing with Google News, it's the first one that gets in. And so how do we do that? We have to provide data, right? We have to use this big data. We have to control this data and give it back. We have to give it back to make sure that we quantify the results and that we reward people for the work that they're doing because they're the ones that are in the trenches doing the work and we have to quantify it. Two tools that'll change your life. One, Supermetrics Data Grabber for Google Analytics. The other one is Amateur Report Builder. Supermetrics Data Grabber, which is fun to say, is $300 a year. Amateur Report Builder is $300 billion a year. But if you have it, you're fine and it does things for you. But Supermetrics Data, Supermetrics Data Grabber, I bet everybody in this room could get $300 in budget to help build this data feedback loop. Why? Because dashboards are cool. Dashboards help us quantify results. They help us get in front of people, get in front of management, get in front of all the upper and lower decks to report on the progress. Red is bad, green is good. What kind of charts? You can segment data, you can show which, which you know, you, a, a friend of mine has always said, I use this as a carrot or a stick. And tell me if you put a dashboard in front of your manager, they would, he or she would say, no, don't ever send that to me again. It's valuable, easy to quantify data, and you mark it up because you can show what happened, what's happening with mobile, what's happening with the home page, what's happening with your, with your section fronts. And you should be sending this around on a monthly basis because if you're not, you're missing an opportunity. And if it's too hard, we built one for you. Go grab our template, get super metrics, super data metrics, well, super metrics data grabber, and dump it in there. That's yours to keep. So for a second, let's go back in time. 2012 image search, Google did this. You clicked on an image, it would load your site in, in the background with a pop-out. 2013, they changed to the carousel, you clicked on an image, oop, no more site, right? They give you attribution, but no more site gets loaded. So what happens to traffic? It plummets. This isn't news, right? This 2013 image traffic just tanked. And that really sucked. Because image traffic was a great resource, is a great source of traffic that effectively came to a halt. And so what did Google say about this? Pierre Farr said that phantom visits were causing problems for some webmasters, and so we thought we can do away with that. That's gone now. This, along with new options to reach publisher sites, is a net win for webmasters. You want to see the net win? That's the net win for webmasters across billions of page views. That's the net win. That's what Google's doing. They're making a land grab for that. Why? Because Google used to be a search engine that had advertisements. Now they're an advertising company that has a search engine. They want to keep you on the site. That's what they're doing. We've tracked this. We've tracked this for 18 months now, and it looks like image traffic is effectively gone. Sure, there's a little bit of it, and there's ways to protect your content, because now we have to go on the defensive. We have to protect our content from Google, which is very interesting to think of. And there's other companies that have done it, like Pixabay. Go check these guys out and read their blog and what they've been doing. They watermark all their images now. They watermark their images, and as it turns out, they've actually seen some traffic increases. And Google's whacking at it. So what do we recommend? We recommend that you watermark and get control of your data. If you're using WordPress, check out the, the WordPress Pick Shield because publishers love their slideshows, but nobody's quite figured out how to do it. Do we use rel canonical? Do we use pagination? Do we use rel previous and next? What do we do with these? Nobody's figured out how to do it because they suck. You get 80 different ways that, you get 80 different comfortable pillows that you have to pick, you know, that you have to select. Does it load pages? Do you do it dynamically? What can you do? We've tried rel canonical, which is technically a misuse of it, pointing everything back in traffic tanked. Sometimes it did well. Google's wildly inconsistent with how they treat slideshows. One thing we have found that works, though, is the view all. 
it gives the power back to the users and then you can optimize it. You can optimize this page easily because these are thin content factories. But if you point to a view all page and you use the rel canonical tag, that works. Then you can optimize that content. And then you future proof. If it's e-commerce, it's a little bit different. So I recommend that you go read Audette's blog, Adam Audette, who spoke here last year. And the bit.ly URL is A-U-D-E-T-T-E. -E. He wrote about what to do with rel previous and next because we can't get it to work. Sometimes, but not all the time. It's inconsistent. Which leads us to our second problem, which is indexation. One of the biggest issues that we come across with enterprise level sites is effectively and efficiently getting our corpus into Google's. And the takeaway here is we don't rely on Google Webmaster Tools. Why would you rely on the data that the company is giving that doesn't trust you with your own keyword data? You're taking Google Webmaster Tools for face value that they're telling you the health of your site. Take back your data and get control of it. Take your XML sitemaps, get Screaming Frog, put it into list mode, run it through, and look at the health of your, of your sitemaps. You're looking for 301s, 302s, 404s, 410s, anything on there that Google does, doesn't like. Even if you download the API feed from Google Webmaster Tools, you're not going to get all the information. So that is a way to, to monitor the health. One of the most powerful queries you can use is you run the site colon on your root domain minus dub dub dub. Enterprise level sites, you're going to find staging servers that were pushed, development servers that were pushed to inadvertently pushed to production. You're going to find duplicate content. You're going to find things that were left over after a migration. It's a very powerful query, especially when you're auditing. But you say, well, we got this. We, it's, fine that we have we, it's fine that we have duplicate content. We have system checks in place that apply rel canonical tags. Let's talk about rel canonical for a second. Because what rel canonical is, by definition, is a strong suggestion. It's a strong suggestion, right? It's not a 301. It's not a redirect. It's a suggestion. So what I have here is, is a query from the New York Times where I found 577,000 properly implemented rel canonical tags that were crawled as recently as last month. Do you want Google spending all of its time and resources actively crawling rel canonical pages? I don't. That's not a good use. That's a crawl barrier. That's not where we want our time used. We make the decision, the conscious decision, to fix the problem. Rel canonical is a Band-Aid. And remember what Rand said yesterday about our dependency on Google? Rel canonical is Google dependent. So move away from the rel canonical tag and fix the problem. Fix the problem of duplicate content. Because a 301 is much better than a rel canonical tag is. So you take the haircut. You take that 15% haircut and play the long ball there. We have a client that has 40 million pieces of content. And they, and it's good content. Not all of it was good, but we cleaned up the duplicate. We cleaned up the overlapping content. But they had 40 million pieces of content. And what we said to them is, let's look at, out of all that content, where the traffic is going. And what we found was that the traffic was going to very few pages. And so we proposed the idea, let's start removing content and see what happens. We removed 90% of their site, and traffic grew 40%. So in this situation, less, less is more. And I, I caution you that your mileage may vary with that. But it's an interesting thought that it's not about that shotgun method of producing as much content as fast as you can, but it's producing good content. And if you get out, if you get out of sorts, you need to future-proof. So these guys have gone a step farther. And now whenever they produce content that is under a certain word count or under a certain value, they'll slap a no follow tag on it, or no index tag on it. It might be usable to the users, but we don't want it. It's in the AAA league until it's ready for prime time. And if it builds up and it graduates, then we'll, we'll take that tag off. So those are the system checks that you can automate to ensure that you are future-proofed. So it wouldn't be a, it, we, we can't talk about publishing unless you talk about Google News, because Google News is an excellent side door into the web results. And when I'm saying side door, think about all the times you see that news module at the top of search results when anything trends. If you can't get into Google News, you should try. Because, and it's getting more restrictive, but if you don't like what they're saying, like Cyrus said, it's my favorite quote too, if you don't like what they're saying about you, change the conversation. 
find a way to get into Google News, but be ready. You've got to be really ready. Go read Adam Shirk's blog about how to get into Google News. Because if you're a publisher, if you have content that's worthy, you want to get in there. Because there's a lot of very interesting tools in there that you can use. So not a lot of people are going to news.google.com. And that's what we're talking about right now. Give us a couple months and we'll tell you how much traffic's coming from the Google News one box from the web results page. But for now, we're talking about just news.google.com. So if we look at 11 of our top publishers and how much content that they produce, which is a lot in the last 18, 18 months, and how many visitors come from that, 60 million are coming from just news.google.com. That's a lot of people using it. That's a lot of users using it. That's enough for me to justify this. And there's a lot of things going on that we don't necessarily need to get into because there's a lot of data around it. But the, the Google News keyword tag, it's useful, but it doesn't supplement the fact that you need to be writing good headlines and you need to be training around good, good headlines and titles. There's the there's a standout tag, which looks cool, doesn't have a lot of traffic impact, and there's workflow issues because you only get seven. But a little known secret about this is that you get as many as you want if you're using the standout tag for other pieces of content off-site. So if you have sister sites, why wouldn't you be using it? Why wouldn't you be using the standout tag as much as you can? And then there's the editor's pick. And this is for the people that, are, that have customized their Google News experience where you can actually see, like we used to do with My Yahoo, you can customize the modules. And there's no traffic impact by using this, but it's just an RSS feed, so why wouldn't you? For the 60 million visits that are coming from news.google, it's a great opportunity. The one caveat to this is that if you don't produce more than 80 words, Google will throw an error. Google News will throw an error in Webmaster Tools, and the content won't be indexed. And with Google News, it's a race. Shitty content gets into Google News all the time. Parasitic journalism, the Huffington Post poaches the New York Times content all the time because they're better headline writers. No, that's not true. They are better Google News headline writers. And so they beat us all the time. However, when you're, when you're watching a trending story, you may only have a sentence or two, right? The other problem is that if you're running inline ads, we call them speed bumps, if this ad appears before that 80 word mark, it throws an error. So you have to watch that that doesn't happen, especially if you're in a race for, for traffic. And finally, one of the big tools that we like to use is News Whip. It's people powered, it's, it's crowdsourced, it's like BuzzSumo, it's like some of the other popular tools out there, but it's people driven. Google Analytics versus Omniture. This data is very interesting to me because these are on sites that are running both at the same time. So the takeaway here is, the blue line, Google, Google Analytics is underreporting, Omniture overreports. So if you're running Google, if you're running Omniture, you absolutely should be running Google Analytics for a second data point. Like Kyle said yesterday, what's better than one data point? Two. And as SEOs, we're often asked to predict if we want resources, if we want headcount, predict what those changes that you're proposing, what they will make. What kind of traffic increase will we see? If you have two data points, it's a heck of a lot easier. We all have to do that. We all have to try to project. So if you can run two data points, absolutely. It's free. If your boss says, oh, but Google will get our data, Google has your data. That's not the problem. Ask Mike King what Chrome is doing when it's, when it's on your site. If you're looking for competitive analysis, your new best friend is similar web. It is eerie how accurate their information is. It's so eerie that they won't tell you how they get it, which means it's valuable. And it's, some of it is free, and it gets expensive real quick. But this is cool. Competitive analysis, that's your new best friend. The mother load of all big data that you have access to is your log files your server files. Everybody in the room technically has access to it. Getting it is a different story, because it's ugly. It's ugly as sin, and parsing it and making sense of it isn't easy. For example, we took a big publisher and took 30 days of data, which was an insane amount. It's like 28 gigs, just one month of data. And we parsed it, and we said, how many times did Googlebot request content from our site. 
And it came back and told us, we found Googlebot coming in 1.3 million times a day. For that same time period, you go into Google Webmaster Tools and ask that same question and look it up, Google Webmaster Tools says 12,000. Google Webmaster Tools is only going to tell you what they want you to know. Why would they do any different? We know. They're only going to show us what they want us to, to know. So if you want the true story, if you want what Google's doing on your site, get into your log files. Because that's a big difference. There's a story there. There's a story that we're going to have to pull out and we're going to have to visualize so we can act on it. So we can tactically act on it. And your new friend is Splunk. Because Splunk will take that data and you can upload it and it'll help you parse it. You just ask, hey, what is Googlebot doing? And it will visualize that data for you. It'll show you exactly what Googlebot is doing. In fact, it'll show you where Googlebot goes. And what was surprising is that you'll find that what you think is happening isn't happening. Now, crawler activity does not dictate popularity of the site, and it does not dictate traffic. It's just showing where Google is active. And what's interesting about this data that we found is that this did not correlate at all with traffic. And it didn't correlate with popularity. It just showed us where Google was going. I want to know that. If you're going through a redesign, if you're redesigning the site, if you're into information architecture, if you want to know how to cascade page rank, which we all do, this will tell you. Because what we found was that, oh, the business section touches everything on the site, more so than the home page, at least important enough that Googlebot is crawling it and accessing it often. That's powerful data. Get your data back and control it. It's out there. And you can do something with it. That's extremely actionable. Because if we're launching a new product package or some piece of content, guess where I'm going to feature it? I'm going to feature it here, and I'm going to feature it on the most crawled pages on our site. That's powerful. And that's extremely actionable. And the pages that you're seeing there probably aren't the pages you think they are. Because they're not the most popular, and they're not the most trafficked. They're just the most actively crawled. So if your site is too big for Splunk, there's other tools out there. There's Weblog Expert. There's Exact Trend. And they'll visualize all this data. They'll help you make that story that you need to connect with upper management. And if you're interested in this, the starting point is David Sotomano's piece that he did for, for, Moz, for the Moz blog two years ago. It's a great entry point. And the bit.ly URL is just Moz log files. That's the starting point. The guy knows what he's talking about. You should read it if you're interested in it. So the roadmap kind of looks like this. You got to constantly be training. You have to reinforce the message. SEO isn't the most important thing in your organization to anybody else but you. You got to create those dashboards to quantify the efforts, to give that feedback loop. Grab our dashboard, read the blog. Watermark your images, protect your assets because Google's not giving you the traffic, so you might as well protect it. You got to play with, with rel canonical and rel previous and next because it's not necessarily consistent. It's not doing what Google always says it's doing. And with slideshows, just point it to view all. That's what your users want. And you can't rely on what Google Webmaster Tools is telling you. We are past that point. So take that data back. System checks to automate because sometimes less is more. Google News is great, gives us chocolate cake. Always run Google Analytics under Omniture. And don't forget the real story, what log file analysis can tell you about your site. So last thing is I just wish for everybody these rolling green hills on a downward slope because that's the easiest, but you got to have a lot of intense challenges because it makes us better at what we do and it makes us better as people. So thanks for the time. It's really nice to be here. Thanks. Thanks. I, I had to write this down. Google is an advertising agency that has a search engine. That would, that's, uh, I think that's fairly accurate at this point, unfortunately. 
Uh, so you, you, I just saw people writing down resources the entire time. Uh, the power of MozCon, we crashed your site, uh, unfortunately. Oh, that's uh, awesome. It's back, it's, it's back up now. <laughs> that's uh, I was so excited to hear awesome. you uh, vouch, vouch for Supermetrics Data Grabber. We use that at Moz. Isn't that great? Uh, and if you don't want to put out the $300, they have a 14-day free trial. No, which, which give is them awesome. the money. Those guys work hard. Yeah. 300 bucks. Uh, so you talked, one question I had, it always comes up, uh, we hear about this, you talked about that site with 40 million pages where you removed content. Mm -hmm. And we hear this a lot of people, you know, should I remove pages? No one ever really knows when the answer is yes. What sort of first, yeah. sites without 40 million pages, what kind of questions should it's people the value. be asking? Is there value to the user? The value to the user, they're going to find those pages no matter what if they're endemic traffic on your site. But the question really is, 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 it, value to have, is it valuable to be pushing out in search? Is it value to, to spend the cycles to optimize, to do the research, to have somebody do the optimization? That, that's, kind of the, that's, that's kind of the weights and balances that we look at. And so we were able to, to determine that there was a lot of content that didn't meet that threshold. And so we removed it, and it worked. But it's a gamble. It's a huge gamble. That's a scary gamble. Yeah. Rand. Oh, boy. <laughs> what? I knew it would be you. Hello. <laughs> Doesn't even sound like me. You look great. <laughs> I can't believe they played that video. That was... um, I wanted to ask about the uh, the trust in Google Webmaster Tools data. Mm. So, I mean, what you showed in the crawl on that site is that an outlier, or are you finding that sort of order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude difference in what's actually being crawled and what Google Webmaster Tools is saying being crawled? that different? And then the, the second yeah, part of that question. is, what about keyword data in Google Webmaster Tools? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So the bigger the site, the bigger the delta. Weird. So that may be that, because look, we have an enterprise crawler. And we know that every enterprise crawl takes a little bit of manipulation, takes some massage. You've got to monitor those dials. Google is no different. They're not infallible as a crawler. And so <clears throat> the bigger the site, the the more mistakes, the more um, the, the, the chance that they're not going to get all the content that you want. They're not going active, to actively crawl the content, which is why indexation is such a problem for big sites. To get a corpus into theirs, yeah, it's, it's not easy to do. And so it's economies of scale at that point. But the other thing is your question about, um, I'm sorry, I forgot. So, uh, keyword data. Keyword data. So we kind of ignore it. Yeah. Now, if you talk to Vanessa Fox, she says no, but that's, that's it's been, it's been, average for personalization. So that what you're seeing in there is actually the source of personalization, the end result of personalization. I don't buy it. Yeah. I don't buy that at all, in fact. There's so, many, there's so much misinformation. And I'm not saying that Google Webmaster Tools isn't important. It really is. But it's just one data point. It's one data point in many. And that's 20%. The other 80%, you've got to go get. And it's a little blood, sweat, and tears. Can, can I ask uh, the blood, sweat, and tears on that key, getting that keyword data especially with not provided, how do you guys do that at an enterprise level to compare against Google? Uh, we don't. That's, that data is not inf interesting to us. Oh. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more quick question for Marshall. Yeah, I just want to apologize to everyone here, especially Rand for my uh, underwear being out of wear, but I will take care of that later. <laughs> So appreciate being called out on that. But I just want to back up a statement about. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> I'm sitting there and he's on the video and I'm going, that's me. Uh, and you're tucked too, dude. Yeah. Well, no, I'm tucked because it's a polo. I'm on the golf course. I don't so know. I figure, we need a ruling on that apparently. Yeah. I don't know. I've got dress pants. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, <laughs> are they pleated or not pleated? Uh, they are not pleated. Yeah, good. Thank you, Lord. Cool. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> My wife would kill me if she knew I was doing that. You're on, you're on your way, sir. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate your untucked shirt. You know, yeah. you could work that even though it was, I, uh, I it was, couldn't. It was a point of contention in breakfast yesterday, tucked or no tucked. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to back you up on the point about uh, knocking out pages. Uh, we actually went through, we knocked out a 1,000 or so pages, mm. but we found uh, we crossed them with social data. We used to cross them with links from OSC and mm. also data from Google Analytics. Most of those pages weren't getting traffic to start with. Uh, so we really weren't losing a lot yeah. in what was coming into the site, but then our crawl efficiency went up, and we've seen improvement too. And so I, I want to yeah. back that up. It, was, it yeah. was scary as hell, but you check the data, and it's okay, and it works. And it is scary, but I would say then baby step it. Put the no index tag on it first. 
nothing happens, then you can ax it. You don't have to just, you don't have to cut everything. You don't have to cut it off at the knees. Baby step into it. Thank you for sharing that. Marshall, thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah. Great. Thanks.